to you today? Do you think that you need him to? Does he have something to say? All right, all right. Well, then, if, if, if you position yourself that way, I'm pretty sure you're going to hear something from the Lord. Isn't that right? If you come in here and think, I don't believe it, well, you're, you'll probably be right that if you don't believe he's going to speak to you, you're probably right. He won't. But if you believe that God has something to say to you, it might not even be what I say. Sometimes people will say, Pastor, what you said was so good when you said this and that. And I'm like, uh, I, didn't, I don't remember saying that. But if that's what you heard, <laughs> that's awesome, right? Because you hear what God wants you to hear. If you have ears to hear, say it. I have ears to hear. All right. So go ahead and do this with me. Open up in, in your Bible, if you, you could, to uh, two places. We'll go to Psalm 139 and then hold your place there and also go to Ezekiel, I mean, not Ezekiel, Exodus chapter 33. And just stick there for a minute. Last week, we, we kicked off the year about prophesying over our year. And I think that message is posted to YouTube if you want to catch it. I think you should because it really does help set the tone for what God is saying to us this year. We talked about the two-edged sword in our mouth and how Jesus had the double-edged sword in his mouth. And when you look at that word double-edged, it's, uh, the same, that word means double-edged, but it also means double-mouthed. It means double-mouthed, and it's kind of weird that it would be both and that it's very uh, much like God that he would identify Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 as having a two-edged sword, not in his hand, but where? In his mouth, right? In his mouth, a double-edged sword in his mouth. He's a double-edged sword. But what that's saying is double-mouthed sword. And the word of God, how does it become a double-mouthed uh, sword? How does it become double-mouthed like that or double-edged? It's when God speaks it to you, that's the first mouth. And then when you speak it out yourself, that's the second mouth. That's when it becomes a two-edged or double-edged sword. It's not in your hands, and it's not just when you hear God speak something to you, but it's when you both hear God speak it and you speak it out. That's a double-edged sword. So throughout Scripture, oftentimes it refers to the Word of God, the reign of the Word of God as a double-edged sword. And so when you're praying and planning and meditating and thinking about your year, you're reading through the Scripture, or not even your year, but just whatever's going on in your life, and you feel like, man, God just brought a scripture to my mind. You might not even, if you're newer to it, you might not even be sure it was the Lord that brought the scripture to your mind. That's okay. When the scripture comes to your mind, let me tell you something. It's not the devil. <laughs> I, you know, the, I guess there are some sometimes that people could, could um, listen to the enemy trying to misuse scripture. But when that scripture is encouraging and bringing life to you, it's not the devil. You might think, well, is it just me? Well, guess what? If you are a believer in Jesus, you have the spirit of God inside of you. So just you and just him, it's hard to tell sometimes. But this is what I'd say. You go with it. <laughs> if that scripture comes to your mind, man, that's God speaking it. That's the first mouth. Now you just begin to speak that out and you pray that word over your life. You pray it and you declare it or you command, you know, whatever situation if it's if that's how it works out. That's when the word becomes a double-edged sword. And we talked about this in relation to Ezekiel going out to the valley of dry bones and he prophesied the word of the Lord, what God said to him, he spoke to the dry bones and commanded them to live. God did not speak directly to the dry bones to live. He spoke to Ezekiel, that's the first mouth, and then Ezekiel spoke it to the people, that's the second mouth, double mouth sword, and he commanded them to live, and they did. The breath came into him, but what the scripture says, he says, uh, hear the word of the Lord. He prophesied and said, hear the word of the Lord. Not just my word, but God's word. But how Ezekiel got to that place at all, you find, you know, how he got there in the first place was in the very first verse of Ezekiel chapter 37, it says that the hand of the Lord was upon him and he was led by the Spirit. So for Ezekiel to be someone who would receive the word of the Lord, to be able to speak the word of the Lord, it, to, it means this. He spent time in the presence of the Lord. He spent time in the presence of the Lord. If the Spirit of the Lord is going to do something in your life, 
That means you're probably spending some time in the presence of the Lord. You are available to him. God doesn't always choose those who are able. He chooses those who are available. (laughs) Sometimes we would love for God to use us, but we're too busy. Man, I want God to break through in my life, but he can't even break through in your schedule. So how is he going to break through in your life? (laughs) Now, we know we say the right things, but when we look at our actual time, we got to reevaluate that and think, I'm going to go after God. I need to move some things around here. I need to put them first. This is not you. This is is us, by the way. It's not just, yeah, you guys, and I got it figured out. Oh, man, I wake up so often thinking, oh, man, here I am again. I know that I've been missing out. I've been missing out. So this is what I want to talk about today is the presence of the Lord and uh, really entering into the presence of, of the Lord yeah, and not leaving. And so let's talk a little bit about the presence of the Lord. And then I think over the next few weeks, we're going to continue just digging into this and, and uh, spending time as God reveals himself by the Holy Spirit and empowers and fills and leads and guides and who he is. So but let's just talk about being in his presence in the first place. Uh, do you believe that, that God is present? So when we talk about the presence of the Lord, God is present in three ways. We, there's his omnipresence, right? God is everywhere. There, there's his inner presence. God is actually in you. And then there's his manifest presence. It's when God makes his presence known in your life. So three ways of uh, God being present, his omnipresence, inner presence, and manifest presence. I ask you to turn to Psalm 139, verse 7. This is a scripture about his omnipresence. He says, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? So omnipresence just means this. God is everywhere, and that's what the psalmist is saying. No matter where you go, up, down, left, right, light, dark, it doesn't matter. God is there. He, his presence is everywhere. But I don't want to talk so much about his omnipresence that he's just everywhere. I want to get to his manifest presence. Now, the inner presence is important, too, of course, and we'll talk more about this. John, uh, Jesus said in John 14, 7, he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he said, The Holy Spirit is with you and will be in you. That's the inner presence of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit comes, when you comes in you, you become a believer, his presence is, is, is in you, like with you in that inside. But then when we get to manifest presence, this is what I'm wanting to talk about here. The manifest presence means to make known. It means to be seen, to be recognized, to be understood. That's manifest. So when we're talking about God's presence, God wants to make his presence known to you. He wants you to understand him, to see him Maybe not with these eyes, but you see the work of God in your life to recognize "Mm, the Lord is here. Oh, the Lord did that. Oh, this is God's favor to recognize that the manifest presence of the Lord. Now, I think that this is what Adam and Eve experienced in the garden in Genesis chapter three. It says that when Adam uh, and Eve were created, God walked with them in the cool of the day. He spent time with them, and and I think that there was this manifest presence. In verse 8, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. But look what happened. Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the, the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so here they were. They had the manifest presence of God. That's what they had experienced. But suddenly sin entered their life, and it caused them to hide from the presence of God of the Lord. And by the way, sin always causes us to hide from the presence of the Lord, even in a worship service. We could come into a worship service, and if there's uh, sin in our life, our flesh will condemn us. The enemy will lie to us, say, well, see, you just blown it. You, You shouldn't even be in here. Don't lift your hands. Don't lift your voice. Don't even look at those words on the screen. Who are you? God knows how bad you are. You know, shame sits in. You ever listen to the voice of shame just a little bit too long, right? You're like, oh, man, yeah, I'm, I'm terrible. That's how, that's how sin works in our life. It gives an opportunity for shame to speak. And that kicks in, and it causes us to want to hide from the presence of the Lord. Now, could they actually hide from the presence of God? Could they actually hide? Because God is everywhere, right? And was God not going to find them even though they 
hid from the presence of the Lord? God, you know, peekaboo, like God, God, it's sort of like when the kid covers his eyes, you can't see me. That's what Adam and Eve were doing with God, because God is everywhere. But yet, they hid from the presence of the Lord. Here's a couple other scriptures. Let me share these with you. Exodus chapter 33. God is speaking to Moses and talking to him about leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And he says to them, now, here's God speaking to, to Moses. He says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Talking about moving forward, my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. Well, God, aren't you everywhere? What do you mean your presence will go with us? Well, well if that was the case, Moses probably would not have responded this way. He said, if you're, in verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. If your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. Well, isn't God's presence over there too? But there's something more than just the omnipresence of God that Moses is after. He knows he needs. Even though we may not be in the promised land, if the promiser is not there with us, if he is not making himself known, even though we experience all the blessings of God, I'd rather be over here in the desert. That's what Moses is saying. I would rather sit here and go around this mountain for the rest of my life if I have the presence of the Lord than to be over there where everything is good and all these blessings and it's comfortable and I don't have you. It's that manifest presence that he's, he's after. Now let me give you another example of this here. Imagine there's a, a multimillionaire in the service today. Multimillionaire in the service today. And he comes to our service e every Sunday. Imagine that. Some of you, imagine who it is. Imagine your face on them. No, <laughs> you can't. Uh, ima imagine that multimillionaire. Now their presence is here with us. But they're not necessarily made known just because they're here. Now, if that person gets up and starts walking around and handing out $100,000 to you, $100,000 to you, $100,000 to you, and going around and just handing out $100,000 stacks, you know, just boom, boom, boom. Imagine that. Some of you are like, yeah, let's keep this story going. Imagine that. He's going around. What is he doing? He's making his presence known. He's revealing himself or she's revealing herself as a, a millionaire who has the means and, and capabilities and the willingness to take from their own resources, their own abilities, and transfer them to you, right? I'm going to go ahead and just pause for a minute in case someone wants to stand up. And I was just speaking. Oh, okay, no, I would just keep going. All right, we'll just keep going. I mean, you could get up any time and do that. But nevertheless, you, you understand the difference of you have the multimillionaire. Oh, yeah, there, there is. But it's different when they're just sitting there in the room versus, hey, <laughs> I got something for you. Okay, right? That's different. It's different. We understand that. And it's same with, the same with God. It's different when God is just everywhere versus God shows up. You know? You, 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 you see uh, the, and understand the difference of, yeah, we know he's everywhere, but yet God was here in a special way. He showed himself in a special way in my life today. So let's talk about this. Uh, entering the presence of the Lord and leaving the presence of the Lord. We'll start off with leaving the presence of the Lord. Is it possible to leave the presence of the Lord? Yeah. Now, can you leave the omnipresence of the Lord? No, but can you leave the manifest presence of the Lord? Yes, good answers. You guys already got this message. We could just go on to lunch. No, let's talk about it, though, from the Scripture. Well, we just read about Adam and Eve, how they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't say hey, Eve, let's hide ourselves. No, the scripture says they hid themselves. So they hid themselves. They left, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. There was something that was happening where the presence of God was coming here, and they said, I'm not going to be in the presence of the Lord. But if you continue in to John, uh, Genesis chapter 4, you see after Adam knew Eve in a biblical sense, then they started having kids. And, and who did they have? Cain and Abel, right? And then those guys bring an offering to the Lord, and Abel's is accepted by the Lord, and Cain, his is not accepted. And Cain gets all upset about it, and he's, 
you know, all butthurt over these things. And God shows up and says, get your attitude right. I accepted his offering, not your offering. Sin is at your door. It's desiring to have you, but you should master over it. And so God has a little godly fatherly talk with Cain. And yet Cain, in verse 16, after he gets so mad at Abel that he kills him, says, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. And Nod is the place where people fall asleep halfway through church. No, just kidding. That's not it. Nod is like uh, up there somewhere east of Eden. Um, so Cain, the Bible says Cain went out from what? From the presence of the Lord. So he would, was experiencing the presence of the Lord, but when he sinned and he uh, disobeyed God and then he, just, he left the presence of the Lord, he went out. He's like, mm, I'm out of here. I am willfully going. Here's another one, Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Where did he go? Did he, it says he, he didn't just try to leave the word of God. He didn't just try to leave his assignment or anything like that. It says he fled from the presence of the Lord. He didn't want to be in a place where God was speaking to him, where God was calling on him and challenging him to step, step out in faith, stretch out, get outside of his comfort zone, step into, you know, do something uh, an act of obedience that violated his view of people in a good way, by the way. It would have been a good way, but he had this really ugly look um, on, the, on the people of Nineveh, and he was judgmental. You would say he has this prejudice there, and he didn't want God to deal with that area of his life, so he fled. Do you think this ever happens in people's lives sometimes? Like they're hearing, they're hearing a call to... Uh, repent or righteousness or a different way of seeing things and and it's the right thing by the way and so they just avoid that conversation they avoid it with people but they avoid it with God huh and they're like I don't want to deal with that 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 area is off limits you can't speak to that and so what they do is they flee from the presence of the Lord I don't want to be in an environment to where I'll have to deal with that sometimes it's not just stuff you've done sometimes it's stuff that's been done to you and there's hurt in your life. There's unresolved things that need to be healed. Sometimes it's a matter of forgiveness. Sometimes it's, it's, hey, God wants to deal with this traumatic experience in your life, and you've got to actually go through that process. You're numb right now, and you're going to go through pain to get to the point of healing. And sometimes that, that right there, people can resist that because it, it hurts. And so I don't want to be in an environment where God's going to bring that up. So Jonah, he flees from the presence of the Lord, says he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. He went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So can you leave the presence of the Lord? Absolutely. Hide from it, run from it, flee from it. You can take a boat from it, whatever it is. How do you leave the presence of the Lord? The answer is really simple. It comes down to disobedience, right? You don't do what he's told you to do. That's how you leave the presence of the Lord. Adam and Eve, he said, he said to him, don't eat. They ate. They left the presence of the Lord. Cain, deal with your attitude. He didn't deal with it. He fled from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, go to Nineveh. He didn't go. He fled from the presence of the Lord. So the key here is... These guys, they left the presence of the Lord when they didn't do what he said. So again, Adam and Eve, don't do it. They did it. It's an issue of God saying don't, and they did. Jonah, it's an, I mean, uh, Cain, it's an issue of the heart. So it's not even the action necessarily that it starts off with. It led to actions, but it's to deal with this issue in your heart. And because he didn't deal with the issue in his heart, he left the presence of the Lord. And then Jonah, God was saying, do something, and he didn't do it, and he left the presence of the Lord. So you can leave the presence of the Lord, the manifest presence of God. But here's the thing. God is omnipresent, and he has a way of showing up over there, doesn't he? Sometimes he shows up over there and saying, listen, I told you <laughs> to go to Nineveh, and he's talking to you in the midst of the belly of a fish. 
Sometimes he shows up and he's saying the same thing somewhere else. Sometimes it's just his mercies are new every day. Sometimes he's letting you know you can't run. You can't run. You might have a praying grandma in this house here. And, and those are heat-seeking prayers. And all you grandmas need to know that. Your prayers can go around corners. Slap some kid in the back of their head and say, get back to church, boy. Right? That, I had a, my friend's grandma was a praying grandma, and her, her prayers got me. I mean, God, wherever you go, there he is. You can leave his manifest presence, but you're going to run into him again. Obedience, it's when God tells you to do something right there, and, uh, and you do it. That's how you enter into the presence of the Lord, and we'll talk a little about some specifics here. But let me ask you this. Is there anything that God's told you to do that you are not doing? Because sometimes people say stuff like this. They say, hey, yeah, I know God's been telling me to do this for years, but I'm just not doing it. So I got to question this. Has God actually told you that, or are you just thinking it's a good idea? Or has he told you, and you're sitting here and saying no, right? Is there something he's told you to stop doing that you're continuing to do? I mean, if we, these are questions we, I, I ask myself when I'm reading, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, there, there are some things, and this, this explains some stuff in my life. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. Like, there are things where I'm reading and hearing the word, I'm thinking, you're talking to me. I'm going to tell them, but you're talking to me. I'm going to double mouth this right here. <laughs> I'm going to say, you, you're saying it to me, but I'm going to say it to others as well. But nevertheless, is there some area of your heart that God has said, I want to deal with, and you haven't uh, let him deal with it, or he's told you to go deal with it, and you haven't? If that is the case, chances are very high that you have left or are leaving the presence of the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean you don't believe in him, you don't have a love for God, that God isn't so gracious and kind to you, but you are n probably not experiencing the fullness, the blessing, the favor, the goodness of God to the extent that he has for you. There is probably a limiting factor in your life, and that might be it, that area of disobedience. You have left the manifest presence of the Lord where he's making himself known and understood and revealed to you. And so that is where we take these things seriously of, oh, following Jesus, doing what, not perfectionism, but I am pursuing the Lord with a sincere heart. So that's even something you would, you would like take a little note on, mental note or on your paper of, what is it that I need to get back to? Maybe there's something that comes to your mind right now or, or to deal with, deal with that before the Lord. So let's, let's talk about this here, um, entering the presence of the Lord. Entering the presence of the Lord. So you can come to church. You can, you can actually pray. You can read your Bible and still not f experience the fullness uh, of the Lord. You might not experience his manifest presence because there is that, that step of obedience and following him. So let's talk about entering the presence of the Lord. Now, there's a number of things that we do that, that keep us positioned in the presence of the Lord. But I want to talk about one primarily today. And it's what we experienced in the beginning of our service here. In Psalm chapter 95, verse 1 and 2. It says, O oh, come and let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. What does the scripture tell us to do? If we are to come before the Lord into his presence, we do it with thanksgiving. We come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Not on thanksgiving. With Thanksgiving, right? You're like, yeah, that's November, right? No, today, right? Today. Everybody say today. This is the day the Lord has made. What's the next verse? I will rejoice and be glad in it. You guys remember that song from like the way back days? This is the day. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it, but that's how it goes. You got it. Thanks, Dane. Uh, you come into the presence of the Lord with singing. You come into his presence. Now, if the scripture tells you how to come into the presence of the Lord, and I just talked to you about how to leave the presence of the Lord, which one of these things do you think is, is a little bit more important? Coming in, right? Like, okay, I want to know how to not leave it, but, but more importantly, how do I enter the presence of the Lord? Well, the scripture says this. Again, I'm going to read that verse, and I'm going to give you the next one. Let us, oh, it says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with a sour look on our face. No. Let us shout angrily. No. Let us shout, open screen test, what is it? Joyfully, Joyfully right, to the rock of our salvation. So it's giving this, this 
uh, instruction, hey, come on, everybody, Let, let's sing to the Lord. Let's lift up our voices and shout. So when the scripture is saying that, do you think it's saying, but I know some of you, it's not your style. And do you think that it's saying to others, I know you're not musically inclined. Do you think that's what it's talking about? It's saying, everybody, every one of us, let's sing to the Lord. Let, now, now, it doesn't even give you the song to sing. It just says, let's sing at first. And then he goes on to say, let's come before his presence with thanksgiving. How do we do it? We're singing and we just begin, oh, thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your favor in my life. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that you're so good to me. Thank you that you're faithful. What are you doing? I'm just directing my heart. God, I'm grateful. And I'm guiding my heart in response to the scripture. And what's happening as I'm doing that, I'm taking steps forward, maybe not physically in the natural, but in the spirit here. And I'm coming into the house of the Lord, the presence of God, the throne room of God. And I'm doing it with thanksgiving. And then he says, and let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. These are songs that we sing. And so some of those songs are songs that flow from your heart. They're not going to be up on the screens. And even as Dane uh, led us so well, and he said, let's just begin to sing a song to the Lord that comes from your own heart, your own spirit right here, your own grateful you know, uh, uh, self right here, just expressing it to the Lord. And begin to lift it up and sing psalms to God, sing songs to God. And some of those songs will be the words that are on the screens as well, or in the the uh, the music that you're playing, I almost said the tape in your cassette deck. Some of you guys have that. You're like, what? No, we got eight tracks. Psalm chapter 100, verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, all y'all. Well, you know, the Central and South America, very warm cultures, and I can see where they lift up their voices, very expressive and dancing. But here we're the frozen chosen, so we just like to sit here and worship God in our hearts. All you lands, right? <laughs> he says, all y'all, you, everybody. It doesn't matter if you, if you uh, have never, you know, shown a bit of expression in your face or not. He says, make a, sh- a joyful shout to the Lord. All you, lo- you lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come, what's it say? Come before his presence with singing. Now, we're talking about the manifest presence of the Lord, and how do you experience that? And the scripture in two times here, now this isn't the only way we come into the presence of the Lord, but this is a uh, very common theme throughout the scripture, especially in the Psalms, giving us the direction, right? How do you come into the presence of the Lord? And if this doesn't matter to you, I think that (laughs) you've got to go spend some time with Jesus right here and say, why would I not want the presence of the Lord? Why is, why is that not a pursuit of my heart? Why, why is that not a big deal to me to be in the presence of the Lord? Because being in the presence of the Lord is so much more than singing. It's so much more than just these moments of feeling good. It's every day of your life. It, it, the sad thing is, for so many people, they, the only time they experience the presence of the Lord is on Sunday. They come in and they enter in, they praise and sing, but then they leave and they don't experience the presence of the Lord. But the presence of the Lord, he wants to be with you every day. Some days I think, man, if I just, I'm in the word and I'm taking time to pray and worship. And you just know, like, man, I feel strong in the Lord today. And God is so good. And you just, you, you have that joy on the inside that flows out of it. And everything goes right. And you're like, the presence of the Lord is here. And there's other days where you can be strong in the Lord. And you spent time in prayer and worship. And God shows up and everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. Those days, whether good or bad, they come. I'm less concerned about whether the day is good or bad, and I'm more concerned about, but what, was I with the presence of the Lord to the midst of it? Because stuff comes our way, doesn't it? But are you going to walk through it on your own, or are you going to walk through it with Jesus? I want the favor of God, the wisdom of God, the grace of God, the encouragement, the strength. I want him to be able to tell me when I'm about to say something that I shouldn't say. Hey, don't say that. But, you know, there are some people who don't even hear God say, don't say that, because they left the presence of the Lord. And they're the ones that say, you know, I just have to say it like I see it. If that's you, never say that. Don't say that. I just tell it like it is. Don't. Don't tell it like it is. Don't tell, don't tell it. A wise man, you know, holds his, his mouth or her mouth, right? 
And then even the fool is counted among the wise when they don't talk. So <laughs> either way, you're going to win if you just hold back there. Come before his presence with singing. Now, again, you don't have to be musically inclined. If you ever listen to me sing, I'd say don't. And if you happen to, you'll know I'm not musically inclined. I mean, I, I, I guess maybe I, I, in my mind I am. I'd be, I'd be a great singer if I had a good voice. I really would. But I, I don't. So I still worship and lift up my voice. Now, you don't have to be musically inclined unless you're on the worship team. You do need to be musically inclined up here, right? We want you to be able to sing and carry a, a tune and, and all that stuff. That's, that is important. But for the rest of us, it doesn't matter. You begin to lift up your voice and praise God, and you, and you think, I don't even know how to do this. I don't know. Well, you just start to think about something that God has done, and you just tell him thank you. And you just turn it into a little song. And you, I thank you, God. I thank you for, for loving me. I thank you for loving me, Lord. Oh, God, I thank you for loving me. Lord, I didn't deserve it, but you love me. Thank you for loving me. And it's like all of a sudden this song that nobody's going to record and put on the radio because it doesn't sound good. But it sounds sweet to the ears of Jesus. And he's like, oh, I want to love you even more and pour out more love on you and favor and goodness and watch this other thing I'm going to do in your life. In that area that you've been struggling with, your boss over there or that family member or something, I'm going to turn that situation around over there. God makes a man's enemies at peace with him when his ways please the Lord. And so these are things the presence of God affects every aspect of your life. So as a church, we are determined to pursue the presence of the Lord when we gather. We're determined. In 2023, we are determined to pursue the presence of the Lord at our gatherings. I met with our worship team last uh, Tuesday night for their practice. I said, hey, let's just, let's, let's pull back on the number of songs we're doing. We're not after just getting the songs right. We got to get the presence of the Lord right. And I don't just mean the team because the team has a heart to worship. And I know you, you and I out in the congregation, we have a heart to worship. But there's something that God wants to take us into when it comes to our gathering together of worshiping that goes beyond where we've been before. And so I said, let's pull back and let's do less songs. Well, why would we do less songs if we want to worship more? Because the time that we take, I want to take steps into it a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, ankle deep. Knee deep, waist deep, you know, shoulders all the way in. I want us to move into a place where, man, our hearts are fully engaged with the Lord. We come into this house uh, full of expectation that we are ready to lift up our voices to the Lord. That we would be a people who are free, experiencing the freedom to express our hearts before God, not worried about how we might look to somebody else, not worried about how we would sing. What we're concerned about is, God, I want your presence in my life. I want to see God showing up and breaking through in people's lives so that it's not just, now we will get to the word because every time we gather, we should have prayer, we should have worship, and we should have the word. But those times of worship, there it's when, it's when God and, and us as a congregation corporately, we meet together and he speaks to us. And we pour out our hearts like water. And he begins to impart things to us and, and do things in our lives and move among us as a, as a church. That we would be that church. That, not just that church like somebody else, but I'm saying that this right here, when you come into this place to worship, that you know you came into something different. This is the kind of thing when people come into worship sometimes, especially when they're newer to it, they're like, yeah, wait till the music starts. I mean, it's so good. And they're not talking about the quality of the music, though you might have good quality music. What they're trying to say, and they don't have words, is, man, God shows up. God shows up. And our worship is a witness to the world. When people see people like you, who are absolutely normal people, no weirdos in the bunch. When people see people like you pouring out your heart before Jesus, and it goes beyond just what they've exper experienced, and the presence of the Lord starts to minister to their heart. Now, all of a sudden, they're thinking, I want him too. I want him in my, in my life also. Experiencing the presence of God in worship changes lives, ours and theirs. So I'm calling on all of us to engage in worship like never before. 
when I, I, I'm asking our worship team, lead us. We're not just going through the songs. Lead us. Tell us when to lift up our voices. Tell us when to lift up our hands. Tell us when to clap. T- you know, until it becomes natural for us and we just know how to flow in the spirit. Tell us when to sing in the spirit. Tell us when to sing with our understanding. Tell us when to be quiet. Like, lead us into that. And I'm asking us as a congregation, let's go there. Tell the person next to you, you ought to go there. You ought to go there. But you know where all this starts? It starts at home. It starts at home. It's not just on Sunday mornings. It starts at home. And I don't just mean you singing with your family, which is great. But I, what, I, what, what I really mean is it starts with the individual. You personally pursuing the Lord. So in your daily time, I gave you those journals last week. If you didn't grab one, they're available there. I invited you to, to start reading through the uh, scripture with me in the same reading plan. And uh, some of you have jumped in on that. It's not too late. If you need to do it, just grab a journal. The reading plan's in the back. But in your time of reading and, and praying, there can be the time of singing. And just taking a moment and beginning to sing before the Lord. And even if it's just 30 seconds today, 45 seconds the next day, to where you can freely worship God on your own personally, you experience the presence of the Lord, then you come together. You think about that as we do that individually. We come together on Sunday. Imagine what it's going to be like, the presence of, of God showing up in people who are already full and hungry as well, but full of the presence of God. This is what we're going after. And no matter what the, day, the uncertainty of the day brings, we can be certain that we'll walk through it with Jesus. Let's bow our heads, and then we're going to take some time to jump into our conversation and connection with each other. But I want you just to take a moment right now. And while your head is bowed, I want you to think, are there any areas of my life that God is saying, hey, um, go back to the thing I told you before to do, not do, or deal with? And if that comes to your mind and and there's something that's just been missing there that um, you got to get back to, just say, Lord, forgive me for that. I, I, I remember you said this, and I'm deciding today to follow you in that area. Do what you say. Lord, we want to come into your presence and, and stay there and not leave. So, Lord, whatever it is on the inside of us, God, that, that uh, needs to stretch out so that we can enter in and, and experience your fullness, Lord, that's what we're after. In your precious name, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this is what we're going to do for about the next 10 minutes. We got some questions up on the screen here. And the first one, uh, I want to go over it with you so you can break up into your your little circles in a second. And for some of you may be newer, so if you see someone newer that's wondering what the heck are you guys doing, just invite them to join you. Although we can never leave the omnipresence of God, we can leave his manifest presence. So take a look at these stories of Cain and Jonah. Did they react in willful disobedience or did they simply make a mistake? What's the difference? Talk about some of these things. Not everybody in our, co- in our circle has to answer every single question, by the way. Just have conversation. And if you're doing all the talking, don't, okay? And, uh, and then if there's someone who starts to invite you to their sales seminar, tell them you can talk later <laughs> about that stuff. You know, if there's ever a situation like that. But let's talk about the Word of God. And let's process these things and say, okay, Lord, but what are you saying to us? Because of God's mercy, He forgives us when we ask, right? How do we open our, our, the door to God's presence? How are some other areas? And then we can be in church yet still not enter God's presence. Why? Talk about some of these things. Let's see what the Lord is saying to you. And um, this is what I believe. I believe it's important to hear the word, but it's important to talk about it and process it and, so that you own it. So 10 minutes, we'll have food in the back. I'll, break, I'll bring us all back together and grab that. But uh, let's jump into the word together in a conversation. I hope you're having some good conversation at your table. It sounds like it. I want to encourage you to keep on with your conversation going. Uh, We've got refreshments in the back. More important than the conversation, keep pressing into Jesus this week. See how he shows up. You can walk in the presence of the Lord, invite his presence, sing out to him. Next week when we come together, we're going to press in even more during our time of worship. So we love you guys. Looking forward to all that God has for us. If you got kids, make sure you pick them up and uh, you come on back to your tables and have some food and conversation together.